And so the current state of play with all of these discussions is that the House of Representatives will be going home to their districts without a decision, without a really a vote on their alternative to the president in, this, in the course of these discussions. And Sean, of course, it'll be interesting to hear how they explain this to their constituents. Yeah. What a way to endear yourself to the voters here in the United States. You know, as we mentioned earlier, John Boehner can say whatever he wants. And in his statement, he very short, terse statement, he said, OK, now it's up to President Obama and uh, the leader, the Democratic leader in the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, Reid, to come up with some kind of plan. Uh, this is going to be interesting. And the fact also the GOP lawmakers I indicated they were going to stay in Washington and work on Plan B. Now they're leaving. And a lot of people are going to interpret this. that They're going to leave with their tails between their legs. What do you expect we're going to hear on Capitol Hill in, in the coming days about this mess? Um, I think there'll be a lot of blame shifting, as there, as there traditionally has been. I think the interesting thing will be to hear how the president responds to this. We know he was already going to veto this plan B anyway, so it was really dead on arrival. Even if it passed, it would have just been an effort by the Republicans <laughs> to say, look, we gave you an alternative. Exactly. But, you know, we know from the polling that most Americans are going to blame the Republicans if this fails. Okay, Jessica, sit tight. Well, we're now going to be joined by Marcus Schomer. He's a chief economist with Pine Bridge Investments for more analysis on the economic and market implications of what's going on about the fiscal cliff. He's joining us live from New York. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, the market seemed to be doing pretty well uh, up until today, sir, and the futures are tanking. Uh, Wall Street doesn't like to be surprised. How is this going to be greeted tomorrow at the opening bell? Well, not, not well, as you already described it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is, uh, this is something that the equity markets haven't priced in. But we also shouldn't forget, uh, we've, we've had volatility uh, related to the negotiations before, but in the background, don't forget, the Federal Reserve is still pumping in a huge amount of money into the system, and it's already promised to double that amount by the beginning of next year. So I think from a, from a market perspective, the downside risk is very much capped by, by, by what the Federal Reserve is doing right now. Okay, M Marcus, the U.S. taxpayers are very frustrated with Congress. Uh, they rate the congressional leaders about as low as they've ever been rated in, in history. Let's presume they do come back and they get some kind of messy deal. Is that going to harm the economy, which in turn is, in turn is going to have a ripple effect on the global uh, outlook? I think it will. Um, in my base case scenario so far has actually been a, a fairly large, sizable deal of about four, maybe even five trillion dollars. I assume maybe we have to go through a crisis to get there, but at the end there would be a sizable deal that would more or less be enough for investors and businesses to move on and really kickstart the recovery. I think now we have a new scenario that we may get a much, much smaller deal, a deal that will be too small mm. to take the uncertainty out of the out of this system and too small also to prevent another downgrade. I think that's something that's looming next year too. Marcus, let me just jump in here for a moment. You talked about a possible downgrade, and of course the last time the credit was downgraded was over the debt ceiling debate, which created uh, this whole mess. This sequester, these uh, defense cuts and uh, tax hikes were all part of a deal to uh, extend the ability of Congress to, to solve that problem. But the next debt ceiling uh, raising is also part of this discussion. Uh, Treasury says we don't hit that limit until the middle of February. Does that give Congress enough time uh, to get to a deal with the president? And how does that play out in the market? Well, the, the debt ceiling is what makes it so combustible. If it wasn't for the debt ceiling, you could see them do what the Europeans have been doing for years, just kick the can down the road six months at a time. But I think the debt ceiling gives the Republicans a huge amount of leverage, and it could be the trigger for a larger crisis, for example, a government shutdown, if the Republicans say no deal, and we also don't extend the debt ceiling, government will shut down, and we will have a much deeper fiscal crisis in the U.S. Marcus, what's the feeling in the financial world? Do you th is, is there belief that Congress, the president, the administration, they can all come to their senses and do something that is in the best interest of the middle class, the backbone of the United States, and keeping the economy moving in a positive direction? Well, I've been, I've been saying to our clients at Pine Bridge Investments the whole year that I think financial markets are, uh, are underpricing this risk. Everybody had this assumption, well, by the end of the year, last uh, at, the at the 11th hour, they will strike a deal. I don't think that will happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the, the risk of a deeper crisis is priced in. However, as I described earlier, I think many financial markets are, you could say, sedated by what the Federal Reserve is doing. Everybody knows that if things get worse, the Fed will pump even more money to the system. So why should we worry? I think that's why markets haven't really sold off yet. 
And Mark, is this, the tax cuts we're talking about and the tax hikes we're talking about in this uh, part of the deal, they're not the only tax hikes that Americans are going to face next year. There's payroll tax cuts, which affect social service programs. The whole package is something like $536 billion in total. How does that play out next year when Americans are going to have a tax hike, whether this is resolved now or in the next two months? They're still facing higher taxes either way. Yeah, add to, add to that the uh, health care taxes, add to that increases in, in state income taxes. Oh, yeah, uh, whatever happens, there will be a significant and sizable fiscal headwind on the U.S. economy for the next couple of years. And therefore, we will not see growth rates in the 4 or 5 percent range, maybe something that people had expected uh, a, a couple of years ago. I think even if the recovery takes off, it will be a rather muted recovery for several more years with growth around 3 percent, which is not a great growth rate. Okay, Marcus Schomer, thanks very much for, uh, for joining us this evening. I